In this video, we'll discuss the different sample types and how they're typically arranged on a plate, as well as considerations when designing your plate layout. There are many different sample types that may be used for your assay, and this video will not include a comprehensive list of all sample types, but we'll go over a few of the most common. The unknown sample type is used for patient or research samples. Each assay is designed to compute a meaningful result for each unknown sample, such as to quantify the presence of an antigen or to qualify the sample, for example, to assign a positive or negative designation. For quantitative assays, the concentrations of unknown samples will be calculated by interpolating the standard curve fit. For qualitative assays, a designation such as positive or negative will be assigned based on calculations such as comparisons to control measurements. Standard samples are used as calibrators for curve fitting. These samples have known concentrations and are used as the ruler for your assay. By using these known values for the standards, the concentration values of your control and unknown samples can be interpolated by fitting a curve to the plotted raw values of your standards. Control samples are also samples with known concentrations. They're typically included in your run, and by examining the mean and standard deviation of these samples, you can ensure the assay has been performed correctly. If you're working with a qualitative assay, you may include a control sample to validate the various interpretations, for example, a positive and negative control. Control samples may be included with your assay kit, but if they aren't, it's recommended to create control samples in-house. You can do this by pooling previously assayed matrix samples that are near the desired range, then creating aliquots and assaying a number of times to identify the mean. Controls are important samples for assay validation and should be monitored across runs. Blank samples are samples that allow you to determine the background absorbance and are usually used in a blank correction step, in which the raw values of the blank samples are subtracted from the rest of the samples on the assay. These samples don't receive sample or detector antibodies and help control for any variation or contribution of the plate or tube itself to the measured optical density. Zero concentration, or ZC, samples are similar to blank samples, but instead contain all buffers and reagents from each step of the assay, minus the target antigen. This can be difficult to achieve, especially if you're measuring a common antigen found in measurable levels in the sample matrix. Sometimes you have to be creative to obtain or create a true zero concentration control. Once you've created or obtained your ZC, you can determine the contribution of all reagents and buffers to the assay signal without the target antigen, or the true background of the assay. The raw values for the ZC samples should be slightly higher than the blank samples if you're running both sample types on your assay. These samples are necessary to calculate a true limit of detection for an assay. The zero concentration serves as a benchmark for the sum of all reagents and buffers in the assay. The total samples measure total activity and serve as a control for enzymatic activity of the enzyme linked to the tracer. The tracer is added to the well or tube after any wash steps. This removes any opportunity for binding and will represent a maximum level of enzymatic activity. NSB samples are used in many assays to detect any nonspecific binding that may take place. These samples are a variation on the blank and zero concentration samples. The goal is to isolate the performance of assay reagents. These samples are blocked as normal, but a wash buffer or blocking buffer is added in place of the reagents at each step of the assay. The final addition of a label detector antibody is performed as usual, and substrate development will occur. The signal for the NSB samples will be slightly greater than the blank samples, but not higher than the zero concentration samples. B0, or maximum binding samples, will find the maximum possible signal for the assay. This is achieved by adding a saturating amount of a sample, followed by a saturating amount of the label detector. A B0, or maximum binding sample, is required to calculate the percent bound for a sample. This format is often used in a competitive antigen capture assay. However, even in a non-competitive assay, it's a good idea to include a B0 sample to define the upper limit of the signal for the assay. Microplates can be configured in a number of different sizes. 6 well, 12 well, 24, 48, 96, 384 well, and even 1,536 well arrangements. The most common microplate size is the 12 by 8 96 well format, which is what we'll use for these examples. When considering the sample positioning on your plate layout, it's important to first consider how the assay is performed. For example, if your assay only has a 10 minute incubation time, it's reasonable to assume the reaction occurs quickly. 
Therefore, any delay in washing the plate, applying chromogenic substrates like TMB, or adding a stop solution may cause drift across the plate. You'll also want to consider how variation can impact your results. How can you arrange your samples on the plate to control for variation where possible? What is the best location for your blank sample? And how can measurement technology affect this decision? If you're measuring samples across runs, for example control samples, where should the control samples be placed in your layout? And aside from these technical considerations, it's also important to consider your laboratory workflow. Especially in high throughput labs, convenience will play a factor. If you're manually pipetting plates, it's important to think about grouping samples to minimize error. And if your plates are pipetted using automation, it's equally important to consider the time to pipette a plate if the samples are not grouped in a logical way. So how do we address or account for these considerations? To minimize drift, it may be helpful to run multiple replicates separated across the plate. This way, the drift will be normalized as the replicates are averaged to report the final result. When selecting how the replicates will be separated, consider how reagents are added across the plate. For this example, I've assumed samples and reagents are added by column, moving from column 1 to column 12. However, if your samples and reagents are added in a different manner, perhaps by row, moving from A to H, this may be a more appropriate layout to minimize the impact of drift. To control for variation, create a plate layout with multiple replicates for each sample. It's common to run samples in duplicate or triplicate to ensure accurate results. A percentage coefficient of variation can be calculated using the results of the replicates, and if a high level of imprecision is detected, the sample can be repeated on a subsequent run to confirm the accuracy of the result. Blank sample location on the plate is important to ensure an accurate representation of the background absorbance. For example, if there is variation of precision across the plate due to measurement technology, perhaps a blank group is included in each row or column. Other options include a dedicated blank group for each sample or a blank sample at each corner of the plate. The most appropriate option will depend on the type of assay you're running and the measurement technology in use. For more information on blank samples and assays, please see the video link in the description. When considering sample locations for inter-assay analysis, often these samples are contained in the same wells for each assay run. For example, if your control samples are housed in wells H1 and H2, as in this example, typically the plate layout will remain the same for all subsequent assays. This ensures you're comparing the control samples in the same conditions for each run. However, there may be instances where you would like to assess how a different plate location can impact results, so the best layout will depend on the desired observations for the specific application. Lastly, it's important to consider convenience and throughput. A plate layout that includes samples in a logical progression will be easier for manual pipetting as well as for automated pipetting platforms. If, for example, your plate layout looks like this, following the set plate map, hunting and pecking for the correct sample location will take much longer. While this may be great for managing drift and assessing variation across the plate, it's not practical for everyday use or for high throughput situations. These examples are all displayed using single plate analysis, but if you're working with multiple plate assays, the principles still apply. When working with multiple plate assays, you have some additional options. Multiple plate assays can have standards on each plate, calculating the results based on each plate's curve or an average of the two curves. Or, a standard curve can be run on the first plate, with validation samples such as blank and control samples on subsequent plates to ensure assay validity. This second option will allow you to save on expensive reagents. The most appropriate layout for your assay will depend on a number of variables, including the type of assay, sample types used in your assay, and measurement technology. If you have any questions about creating a plate layout, please email us at support at myassays.com. If you'd like additional information on the different data analysis platforms available through MyAssays, including a free online data analysis service, please see the link in the description.